Ladies and gents, welcome to another podcast. Shroom here for the Shroom Live. Tonight I've got Coast Fish's Andy Spahn on tonight with me here. He's going to be talking about a few things. He's going to be talking about Gold Coast, landlocked lake fishing for giant GTs and more as well. So other species that may be involved in this sort of situation, this sort of habitat. Uh, as you guys know, he is a pretty famous uh, fishing YouTuber. He has you know, quite a bit of content as well. So probably going to ask him a little bit about that because some of you guys probably want to listen to this and find out a little bit more about, you know, the big man as well as, you know, targeting these big fish in Gold Coast landlocked lakes, which is definitely not something that I've done myself. And that's why he's here to share in a little bit of his knowledge. So Andy, welcome to the podcast tonight. How are you going, mate? Yeah, good. I appreciate you having me on, Pete. I'm one of your biggest fans, you know that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I stalk you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Like Andy, just uh, you know, let let the folks know at home how many times have we tried to actually get this podcast off the ground. Well, uh, I think I've had about three anxiety attacks and kicked my PC twice. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a bit of a journey, mate, to to get all the tech side of it done. But we've we've got there <laughs> somehow. I don't know how, but. That's right. It seems like we've put in about 10 plus, maybe even 12, 13 hours just to get this podcast yes. off the ground. So I'm hoping you folks at home really take this one in, absorb the information, enjoy yourself. You know, as if you're listening to it in the car on the drive to work or a long trip, you know, just on your, you know, your Saturday morning going for that, you know, that mission, that fishing mission or any other time, maybe you're snuggled up in bed. Ah, uh, yeah, definitely enjoy this one. So let's talk a little bit about yourself first, Andy, because you know, like we just said, like I just said earlier, a lot of people follow you for your fishing content. So YouTube is definitely the place that's probably put you on the on the map, and I'm sure like a lot of little kids and you know, obviously adults as well, ask you for a lot of advice about fishing. So what's some of the common questions that you get? Yeah, you know, the the number one for sure is, um, mate, where do you fish? Uh, you know, they, they it's it's genuine, and um, you know, where do you where exactly do you go? And I I fish on the in the landlocked lakes mainly, and I'll fish the rivers on the GC, Gold Coast, um, Jacobs Well, and there's a lot of um, trekking and exploring involved in finding some of these spots, and you know, one out of half a dozen times you'll actually come onto a half decent spot so yeah it's definitely uh it's it's hard yakker and it's the gold coast is such a sort of compressed area with the population and a lot of people like fishing so it's really hard to find exactly where to fish but being asked where do i go is definitely a um a, one of the more common questions that i do get yeah definitely i totally understand receiving a question like that so Without obviously identifying actual pinpoint, you know, marks, for example, how does one go about finding their own spots in a situation like that? Say that they want to chase, I guess, giant trevally, for example. That must be the species that you get asked, or, uh, you know, asked about in amongst others. Well, the good news is um, we've got technology and that's Google Maps. Google Maps is my go-to and, uh, you know, whether you ask me in person or ask me on YouTube or hit me up on Instagram or Facebook or wherever it may be, um, I'll tell people the same thing. Google Maps is your God, um, especially if you're fishing. It doesn't even necessarily come down to the Gold Coast. It could be anywhere. Um, landlocked lakes, you can easily see them. It's a, it's a matter of elimination. So, Basically starting your, your way up one end and working your way down to the other and eliminating what doesn't work and then maybe if you get some clues about what fish are there is going back and, and heading in with some, uh, some knowledge and the right gear and a little bit of optimism and you may score the diamonds in amongst the rough. Yeah, awesome. Now, this is another question that I get and I'm going to ask that to you. What's the biggest fish you've caught? Surely that's got to be one of the top three or top five questions you get in your inbox. Well, do, does a stingray count as a fish? Does Absolutely. It, 
does it? Well, I, I would have been, I would have been fifteen. Um, it was in South Australia because I was brought up in Adelaide, in SA, in in Port Adelaide. Um, you know, you might be familiar with that from the footy team, the the Magpies and and whatnot. Um, and as a as a young bloke, uh, I would all I would do was fish um, with a good mate Pete, uh, and we happened to bump into the the president of the Henley and Grange Fishing Club. I wish I could remember his name, but we are going back uh, a long time. Must be God, thirty years, something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm forty nine. I, I can't work it out. I'm I'm on the spot. Um, but yeah, it's uh, yeah he he. He, we met him and, and he taught me a lot of the early fishing styles and um, he actually offered to take me and Pete out um, further down the coast and take us out fishing and he's a very well known um, fisho in, in SA. So we we went down there and fished off this break wall and I was all set up with um, an overhead rod and, and, and reel and I'd use some of, um, I wish I could remember his name, use some of his gear as well and we were hooking up Barracuda. I think it was Barracuda in SA, or Barracuda yep. with a T. I, I get confused myself. Um, but then the reel went off. It went right off. Uh, and I was fighting this thing, and, you know, I was young, and I've got no muscle on me, and I've, I don't have much now. And I, <laughs> I, was, I was fighting this thing and, and, and begging um, begging the bloke to stop. Just, just, yeah, just grab the rod, mate. Can you do it? And he's like, no, nah, this is your fish. And I fought this in and... You know, everything's bigger when you're younger. Um, yep. I do appreciate that. Like, you know, a salmon, a salmon that big, it looks that big when you're a kid. You never forget these these special moments. But this thing was genuinely massive. It was a big uh, eagle ray. It was absolutely ginormous. Um, the wingspan was just out of this world. I, I don't know what it would have weighed even back then. It was just incredible and um yeah, we just had to pop the line and, and, and let her swim off. But, yeah, that was just – I could have jumped on the thing and it could have surfed me off the Bondi. You know, it was it was just – it was huge. I'll never forget that. But that was a big fish, if yeah, you want to call it It sounded like it could have literally taken off. Oh, yeah, easy, easy. You know, the new – the Eagle Ray Fly Uber. through the air. <laughs> it's like yeah. – Straight up to the Gold Coast. Oh, mate. Oh, we show – that was incredible. But I guess if, if you don't call that a fish, probably probably one of the biggest ones is, I mean, I did catch a marlin. It wasn't a massive fish, but it was one of the smaller marlin on the Gold Coast. Um, caught a big GT. That was, we estimated around sort of, we couldn't decide between 22 and 25 or 26, so we said 23. That yep. was in the landlocked lake, and that was only wow. in re the recent couple of years. And, and, mate, she was a big fish. The fight was just... The fight was incredible. Like it's, you know, you, a lot of guys who watch um, some of the guys fishing up north and and popping on the reefs, hooking these twenty kilo, twenty five kilo fish, they probably go, well, you know, these GTs in the landlocked lakes, maybe they're a bit sluggish, you know, a bit slower because they're, you know, they they're not as active, um, or, or like a like a, a a bloke sitting on the couch all day eating potato chips. But I will tell you what, when you hook one of these things up. And I've hooked GT on the reef. They go just as hard. And you're not going 1,500, 1,800, 2,500 k's up north. It's literally it's CBD, landlocked lakes on the GC and yeah. northern New South Wales, by the way, right up the, the northern end and the Sunshine Coast and anywhere further where there's a landlocked lake. If you can stalk them, you're going to find some just incredible fish. And getting back to the question so I don't get lost in, in convo, yeah, that was that was one of the biggest fish fish that I've ever hooked, um, and a big barracuda. Um, if you yep. want to check out the Instagram channel uh, Coast Fish TV, all one word. If you scroll down, you'll see me holding this big barracuda, is well over a meter long, in a landlocked lake. Um, it was just an incredible fish. That was a big fish too. So I've come across some big fish. You never forget them. Yeah, awesome. And definitely we'll have your details at the end of the podcast on, you know, your socials, Instagram, YouTube and all that. Now, how did you get started into the world of YouTube? I'm sure that's a question that a lot of your followers want to know. Well, I actually, um, I, bought a, I bought an old Panasonic Handycam 
um, for Thailand because I was going to Thailand with my, my brother and, and a couple of his mates and um, I went there just to do some filming and whatnot. And I took it back and it was sitting in a box and I had nothing else to, to sort of use it for but I started getting into that um, that filming mode. I thought, hey, I'm really, really enjoying this and, you know, in, in and out of focus and whatnot, um, doing a bit of editing on, what was the old editor on um, Microsoft? Uh, Oh, that one was called cheapy. Windows Movie Maker, yeah, I believe. That, yeah, that that one. I was mucking around on that and just having fun doing it and being creative. So I decided one day to buy um, just because I, I really didn't have a lot of money. Um, I just bought a, a cheap second-hand tripod, whacked the Panasonic on there, and I used to sit it down here, record on a pontoon or off the rocks and sort of try and get it so it's on a half-decent angle and start casting and... Yeah, just, just doing adventures, getting in the car and traveling south, north, wherever. And I had all this footage and I wanted to use it for something. So I, I, I threw it on Windows Movie Maker. I'd make these little clips and yeah, I just enjoyed doing it. That's, you know, that was, I, th- I don't even think monetization was around back then. Um, you know, you weren't making money from it. So it was just, just pure enjoyment. Um, you, you wanted to, you know, leave a stamp of and a memory of of your experiences. So, where better place to put it than on YouTube? And you can show and brag to your mates and say, "Look, I, you know, I experienced all this. Do you want to check this video out?" And you can send them the link and and bang, you know. And I just got into it and then um, thought I'd go a little bit more professional on it. Um, you know, sort of make a logo. I created a logo. I used, I did it all on PowerPoint. Believe it or not. Um, yep. I, I just I just got all these cheap little um, programs and and whatnot, and I just started. I thought, you know, what what fonts am I going to use? Does that look good? You know, some of the attempts I made to get to do the logo of Coast Fish TV were just, you know, it's one of the, oh, you know, it's, it's it's not that fantastic, but yeah, I did, I just put it all together and put it up there, and back then you'd get a lot of views. Um, it wasn't such a flooded market as it is today, and. Um, you know, you could literally catch a brim on bread and, and get 20, 30,000 views on that video in no time. Um, you know, I was, I was just enjoying the journey and yep. I guess I just kept on with it. I, I mean, I've, I've slowed off these days, but um, I've got plans for the future, but I don't take it as seriously these days. And, um, you know, it's, yeah, it's just something I enjoy doing. I, I think any Anyone should do it. You know, have fun. Get yourself a, a cheap GoPro. You don't even have to get a, a 9, 10 or 11. Get yourself like a 7 or 8 and, um, yeah, have a crack at it. There's a question that I want to pose to you that as a content creator, I'm sure you get asked this. And it's a question that can help other young budding anglers get into, you know, the world of creating content, especially YouTube. So do you have any bits of advice you have for someone that wants to get into this? Um, have a go. Don't don't be too worried about what other people are doing, and just do it for yourself. Um, one of the biggest things, especially if you're really self conscious, and you know we're all human. Um, we all care about what people think to a degree. Um, you know, being a YouTuber can be a bit of a challenge, and the more popular you get, I, I guess the, you're open to. Um, all kinds of criticism and judgment, but I just say stay focused on on what you do. You're doing. Make sure you're having fun. That's that's the thing. Go on your own little journey. Have fun. Get yourself a GoPro, even a secondhand one. I'd probably go an eight upwards. Um, get yourself a little laptop, a PC, a cheap editing program. You don't have to go all out and Adobe and all that, all the expensive stuff. Um, get your contact together, have fun. Um, that's, that's probably the biggest thing. Don't worry about what other people think. You're going to get knockers out there. It doesn't matter how good you are or how good you think you are, you are going to get knocked, and that's just the way it is. Um, don't take it personally. Um, you know, Generally, generally the, the, the knockers out there, are the, it's a reflection of how that person's feeling about themselves, unfortunately. So... Yeah, it's uh, it's that's that's probably the important part. For me, it's 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 more of a, a emotional advice than just hey, get a computer, get a camera, learn to edit, go fishing. It's there, there's another aspect to to being creative or being a public figure, if that's what you want to call it. Um, be aware of that side as well. 
make sure you enjoy it. I can't stress that enough. Have fun with it. Um, post content regularly. Um, if you can throw up, say, one video once a week, um, fantastic. It's a, it's a lot of work though because some, you know, you get bad weather, you get bad fishing, and um, sometimes you can't get that content together. But you can always, if you're having a good day, um, fish four hours in one spot and then go four hours in another spot on the same day. So it's a big day, but you've got two episodes in one day. Um, but, you know, I used to put episodes out online whenever. You know, I'd, I'd put one yep. put on, online and then six weeks later I'd drop another one. Then sometimes two months later I'd drop another one. And then two weeks later I'd drop another one. But that was back in the old days. So algorithms have changed a little, little well, actually a lot since then. Algorithms are brutal. Um, it's hard to get started now, but that's not to put you off. Um, if you've got unique content, you're showing your personality, be natural, have fun. Um, don't worry about the knockers. If, you, if you're, getting plenty of, you're getting plenty of knockers, it just means you're doing a good job, believe it or not. That's, that's what it is. And generally, the better you are at it, um, the more knockers you're going to get. Um, that's, that's my basic advice. It's, it's not rocket science. Get out there with a the camera, have fun, throw a camera on your head. I mean, guys do chest cams as well. Um, they put a GoPro on the chest. I prefer putting a GoPro on the head. Um, for me, as long as you're not going like this all the time, throwing your head around, I think it's a better vision um, than doing the chest where your hands are right there and you can see this kind of stuff and it just feels a bit too crampy for me. So, yeah, throw one on your head. Just get a head headband and, and you're sweet. Put your hat back the front makes it easy so so the camera doesn't pick up the brim of your hat um yeah it's and then you've got the spec side of it you know what do you film in um do you do linear screen do you do wide do you do super wide well, i mean i can talk about the tech side because i've pretty much got that down pat if you if you wanted to dig into that yeah i think that that was some golden advice right there uh i think the tech part we can leave that for another time uh, because we've got something more important uh, to talk about now. But I think that that answer was extremely comprehensive. I think that anyone that was seriously considering getting into it, because that is definitely a question you would get asked a lot. And it's hard to just type that out. In a That's message. what I tell people. I'll tell people that face-to-face -face as well. Yeah. Whereas here, you can just pretty much just vocalize about... 5,000 words in about three minutes of speaking. So that's the beauty of this as a podcast. All right. Now, targeting these big fish in Gold Coast landlocked lakes, I think the first thing we should just define is what is a landlocked lake? Oh, that was, that's not an easy question, mate. <laughs> no, it's um, a landlocked we'll lake. We'll try our best here. Yeah. This, oh. yeah. I think every, people might have a slightly different understanding. There might be a technicality here. Yeah. But we're just going to talk about the sorts of lakes that you're going to be you know, yeah. referring to here. Whether they're actual technical landlocked lakes, we'll just refer to them as that. Well, how do I explain it? It's, it's simple, but it's complex. So you've got, uh, you've got the sea. It goes into a river. Then the rivers might go into canals. And then it's sort of like a tree. You got the you got the um, what do you call the thick bit? The trunk. Oh, the trunk of the trunk tree yeah, goes that's into right. the branches. <laughs> goes into the small branches. Goes into the leaves. The leaves are kind of the landlocked lake bit. So they're sort of right at the end usually, or they could be along the branches somewhere, depending on the development. Usually they're they're artificial. They're man-made, um, right. not natural. So they could be because if you've got housing estates around them or you know, whatever it might be that they, they actually get bulldozing and dig these out. Um, usually they are tidal. Um, so, for example, if you've got the river and then you've got your, your landlocked lake right there, you've got something in between, you've got drains underneath and fish are coming in and going out and blah, blah, blah. Um, usually the, the fingerlings or the smaller fish, your bait fish, your juvenile fish, will flow in from the river into the landlocked lake and some of them will get back out, but not all of them. And that's when right. the fun begins. Um, that's when you, you start getting fish 
developing, growing in size, increasing in population. And there comes to a point where some of these fish are too big to get out. And guess what? They aren't going anywhere. They're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's why you get some extraordinary fish in these lakes. You get some extraordinary size mangrove jacks. And yeah. if I said to you um, 60s, 70s, and in some cases 80 centimeter jacks, which normally, wow. oh, they're massive. Uh, you know, guys are going off the reefs to get these fish if they can stop them. And then you get a lot of spearos going out. Um, and getting these fish, they're absolutely massive, and they're in these landlocked lakes. Your giant trevally, well, we we think one of the biggest was caught was probably about 30 to 32 kilos. Absolute mammoth of the thing. You can't go That's anywhere. That's insane. Yeah, it can't go back through the drain, so they're just going to get big. So it's... I've probably gone overboard again with my explanation, as I do, but... That gives you an idea of what a landlocked lake is, what its purpose is, what could be found in there. Hopefully, I've explained it okay anyway. You know, that was a great explanation. It answered my next question, which was basically asking you what makes this sort of habitat special and unique. You know, as opposed to, say, somebody going off the reef, going up north to Mackay or anywhere else and trying to hit that big one. And you're telling me that you can get these, you know, mid thirty keggers, you know, just a little landlocked lake. It's just insane. It blows my mind thinking about it. Mate, it blows my mind every time. And sometimes you get to see these fish swimming around. You should see the bow waves on them. So you're standing on the edge of the lake. It it could be for sometimes you'll you'll go there ten times, not see anything. And then one occasion you got two of these brutes side by side cruising through the water with a head bow wave, a pressure wave on the front of them and a, leaving just a big wave behind them and you're watching these things go past. Sometimes it's just about going there and just enjoying watching these creatures. It's not about catching them all the time. I mean, I love catching fish but also um, want to put them back. I don't want to hurt these fish. Um, enough fishos know about it. They can go in and they start killing fish. The rejuvenation of the population of these fish is very slow, very slow. So. You could have fish in there for years and years and years. Um, yep. Unless their population gets to a sort of, I, I can't, I don't know what term they use, a saturation point or whatever, where they can actually sustain themselves. If yep. you're getting heaps of fish shows coming in there and start to knock things off and knock these fish off quick enough, um, you can fish these areas out. Um, I've, I've seen changes in some of the landlocked lakes in the last sort of five, six years noticeable ones um yeah you know back in the day while well, we we're trying to figure these fish out what do they eat um how many are around um, what what gear can we handle them on um we're getting more bust offs than, than you can imagine and, and now we've got all the gear we'll get a few but something's happened over the last few years um that's my advice for anyone listening you know if you go and hit these landlocked lakes I wouldn't advise to eat the fish anyway because sometimes they've got runoff. Um, you know, they've got, it could be fertilizers, um, you know, contaminated water, building sites. Think about that before you go to landlocked lakes and start wanting to kill these fish to eat. Yep. Get in the sea, go in the river where it's clean and flowing. Um, these can get algae blooms. They can hurt you, they can hurt your family. So you're best off catching them for fun and putting them back in and maybe catching a few more later on. Um, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's an incredible thing to see, mate, and um, sustaining these landlocked lakes is what makes them special and it will save you a 2,000-kilometre two, drive up north. Yeah, that's a good point, Andy. I guess, like you said, the water, I mean, what's the word there? Like a turnover or, you know, just refreshing the system, it doesn't happen as quickly and readily as a normal flowing river. So you've got, like you said, fertiliser and all sorts of, make possible chemicals flowing into that sort of water and just sort of sitting there for long periods. And even if it does exit that lake, it's pretty much bottlenecked with the amount of flow of different waters coming in and out. Yeah, we just had a massive algae bloom in, in one of the local lakes and I was worried. I was actually checking it out every few days, waiting for floating fish on their sides. Um, that was a bit yep. scary. It's... Um, one of the biggest algae blooms I've ever seen, and I was just praying 
um, you know, for those bigger tides, the full moons. I think a full moon was coming up and I was praying to hurry up to get that flow going because it doesn't have a lot of flow in some of these landlocked lakes. Um, you'd think the fish are lazy and stagnant. Maybe, maybe they don't have to fight as hard for their fish. So when you hook one, they don't fight as hard, but they, they do go berserk, believe it or not. Um, yep. But, yeah, it is scary um, in relation to worrying about the future sustainability of the population of these fish and for all you guys you know listening at home and i know you very very popular yourself um a lot of people listen to your show um, my advice is really take that in consideration if you come across these lakes um, or someone tells you about hey i heard your podcast i know a lake where i see these big fish but i, I don't really know how to catch them i'm not a fisherman you come down um Keep that in mind because you can fish these places out. Um, they don't replenish as quick. Um, you've got to think about these small little trevally and, and these mangrove jacks getting in there and taking years and years and years to grow. Um, if, you, if you're knocking them off, well, you know, that's uh, it, it, those places yeah. could die pretty quick with uh, yeah, fair some, point. Of the, some of the beautiful populations they have. Yeah, fair point. Uh, yeah, like I, like I want to emphasize, there's a few reasons to practice catch and release uh, more so than keeping the fish. The water, probably the quality of the water there isn't as great. Uh, so obviously there's a bit of an asterisk keeping a fish inside that bit of water as opposed to in the main clean, clean more flowing river system. Uh, but yeah, I, I'd say um, that's probably... Probably a good reason why, you know, you, you probably don't want to keep too many from that area. And they're big, so they're pretty old as well. So they've been absorbing that sort of condition for a long time. They couldn't have just ended up in there. They've probably been in there for years and years. Mm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't eat one from these landlocked lakes. And especially if you get, um, dep you know, you get fertilizers and whatnot. We know that happens. And when it rains, it floods in there. It, it gets pushed off the grassy areas into there. And, you know, we've spoken to people. We spoke to some of the – he's been doing it for years. You speak to some of the people that live there and you speak to the groundsmen and, and whatnot that look after the grounds and they go, yeah, mate, we, we fertilise it every such and such. And, um, you know, they've, they've seen us fishing and they said, you're not eating anything from here, are you? And I said, no, nah, we don't intend to. He goes, you wouldn't want to because, yep. you know, it might accumulate some of the toxins – in their flesh and, and 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 this is this is not trying to talk you out, talk you out of fishing there but just don't eat the damn things um think about your health go buy a piece of fish or go fish the main river where it's where it's clean but yeah you know at least you can come back and enjoy the the awesomeness of of what landlocked lakes have to have to provide you made a fair point so i was going to ask you why did they grow so big and I guess it's the fertilizer. You know, you fertilize plants and they get bigger. Oh, stop it. Same Pete. thing for the fish, right? <laughs> uh, this is Carl Barron from Sydney. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, um, they can't go anywhere. So they're only going to get bigger and bigger. Who knows how big some of these fish will get? They'll get yeah. crazy. So you think it's um, any specific reason besides from, I guess, lack of predators that could end up in that? Pretty much that food chain that chops off the very tippy top where the sharks might be. Yeah, well, apparently we've we've heard that in some of these lakes there's the odd bull shark. Um, who knows whether it's true? I've been looking at these lakes for years, and sometimes I won't even fish. I'll just pull up and go for a look. I've never seen a, a bull shark in a couple of the landlocked lakes that I've oh, no no evidence or indication of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think once the GTs get so big, I mean, it's, there's generally in land, landlocked lakes, there's big mullet, like big bull mullet. They feed on those. They'll definitely smash brim and they might even go for the big mangrove jacks in there. So, yeah, there's pretty much not much that can knock them out but fishermen um, and things like algae blooms or you know, some kind of natural disaster or big rapid change in water, some of the, some of the cold... Um, what do you call it, the cold snaps that we we have had in the past. And yep. I did a video, it's on Coast Fish TV on YouTube, about a cold snap that happened on the Gold Coast. 
Um, I'll tell you the lake, it's Emerald Lakes. It's a popular lake, commonly well known. And they found some really big giant trevally in there. And, and I found some whoppers. I went straight down there and filmed and checked it out. And that cold snap um, wiped out a lot of big fish in there. So, yeah, it, it can happen at any time. Um, yep. There was another lake, a smaller one that we checked out, uh, that we have fished. It was a, a much smaller lake. And there was big Gs in there. And we found three or four big Gs. A um, couple were sort of floating um, there was a couple sitting on the bottom on the edge of the bank and it was just a, to see these beautiful creatures, you know, basically dead. It was, yeah, it was a bit of a shock. And that yeah. was all from a massive um, uh, temperature change, big cold snap, a sudden, sudden cold snap. And when it was cold, it, it came out of nowhere and it was freezing. Yeah, fair enough. So mm. these random environmental sort of situations can cause a huge disruption and maybe decrease numbers of these big fish. But, you know, Barry, the bull shark, probably doesn't want to eat his mate that he's got to know in that lake because there's no other sharks in there. So, Mate, if I, was a shark, the be, if I was a shark, it'd be a buffet in there. I'd, <laughs> I'd, cl I'd clean up. Do you suspect that, I mean, just imagine this sort of situation. They wouldn't have to be swimming in the current because the current must be either non-existent or very slow. They don't have to pretty much propel themselves and they're just lazing about. Do you suspect that they have different feeding patterns? Maybe it's slower or, you know, just certain certain situations where they may feed more aggressively? Yeah, yeah. Um, they... What I find is when we get our big tides, so you come up to the new moon or the full moon, um, and the tides start getting bigger and bigger. So instead of, say, ending, and I'm talking about my particular area, at, say, 1.3, we're starting to hit 1.6s and 1.7s and even close to 1.8s. Um, the water's flowing from the main river into the landlocked lake a lot more aggressively, a lot faster. Um, you know, it's leaving a wake. Um, so almost a pressure edge there. The yep. fish are basically coming in a little bit before it hits that sort of high point at a certain point. Um, and they're feeding aggressively and they're going in for the kill and they're on for an hour, hour and a half sometimes. And that's when that's when we go in, put a live bait in. And um, besides that, if, if nothing's flowing, you don't know where they are on the lake. Um, they're probably right at the other end looking for maybe pressure from the other end of the lake or some, yeah. or maybe they're going down deep um, looking for stuff around there. But it definitely, they're hard to find and hard to locate in area if, if there's just no pressure around anywhere. They probably go deep, sit down there, go around in circles like GTs do. But as soon as something happens at either end, with flow, yep. with big high tides, um, it's like, radio boys, let's go. And they head that way. If it's coming in or if it's coming in that way, they'll head back that way and they'll try and ping fish being thrown through the drains or whatever other fish might be attracted to that flow. So they definitely look for faster flow. Yep. Um, if not, we've, we've had talks about where do these fish actually go? What do they do? Um, we can only speculate, but... That's it for, you know, for, for actually knowing. We just don't know what they do. Yeah, I find that interesting. I guess the old, you know, the old thought of no run, no fun applies. But, you know, a fish that finds itself home on, on a reef, you know, out in the middle of the ocean where the current is ridiculously strong, can somehow just, or 35 kilos of it just remains stagnant like, I don't know, like a Murray cod or some other big fish in slow moving water and be content with that. It's just, I can understand the confusion there of what are they doing and where are they when there's nothing happening? I think they're still cruising. Like they're pelagic fish, so they're always on the move. Um, Murray cod, uh, they can basically sit under a log or in their hole and not do a lot at all at all. In, yep. But these things have got to really keep moving. Um, otherwise, you know, they, they could be in trouble. I, I can't, I can imagine it wouldn't be too good for their health if they were just sitting around not doing much. So we know from just watching some of the um, um, Nat Geo footage of what what the habits are of giant trevally and a lot of pelagics and Spanish mackerel and 
you, you know, name the list. They're, they're either always moving or they're going around in circles. So they're probably out there in a landlocked lake just swimming around in circles, waiting for some pressure uh, to come from one end of the lake when it starts flowing on the bigger tides and they just go berserk and start hitting bait fish. I want to ask you a little bit more about them swimming around in circles. So what is that all about? That's something that I'm not aware of. I just think it's a schooling pattern. You are, you are asking a question of, of more of a, a marine biologist here, but some fish, as you know, um, you know what the jewfish do. The jewfish can go from one hole to the other and then turn around and come back. And when there's a bit, a lot of flow there, they can hide behind a bommy or a rock or whatever it might be. And um, when the tide slows down, they start coming out behind and start hunting. That's why we get a lot of the jewfish when on the on the stagnant tides or the the changeovers or neat neat tides. Yep. Um, I think it's just a, a, a pattern that they've that they're obviously like used to from from birth, I guess, swimming around in circles, um, protection in numbers. There's a few different species of fish that do it, and uh, you know, even when you've got your snapper that don't traditionally do the big circles, um, you know, the tuna are always going. Yeah. Yep. Usually, um, I mean the. I'm not a marine biologist. I, I can't say why exactly they do it. You'll have to ask one. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure there's a there's way more better qualified people to sort of answer that question. But um, yeah, it is interesting to watch anyway. If you watch, uh, if you if you're a fan of Nat Geo or underwater footage. Yeah, no, that was a great answer. Obviously, Thanks, mate. you know, just ha- explaining one's own thoughts on how something might happen. That's what it's. That's what it's all about, really. Yeah, I mean, there's no 3. handbook 0. on, you know, what fish do after hours once they clock off work. <laughs> so, I don't know. What do they do? I should ask you. What do you reckon they do? Yeah, they're, they're, they're looking at the, the latest uh, baits <laughs> yeah. that might be hitting the water soon. Yeah. What do fish bite at certain times? Yeah. What do they fire up? You can catch them on soft plastics and then they just stop. You know, it's 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 quite interesting. I mean... But if you get 10 knowledgeable fishermen together and ask these really interesting, in, intricate questions, um, you might get half of them saying, look, we're not sure. And then you get four or five different interesting versions. And, you know, it, it'd be a good conversation to have just to have a list of the, the more intricate questions and the, I guess the difficult ones that we, a lot of people maybe don't think about. Yep. But, you know, you're definitely curious about it. And, you're making me curious about it as well. You know, why, why do set things happen when it comes to fishing? And is it, and is it the more that we know, the the easier that we can sort of work things out when to go fishing? What, what locations, like some locations, will fire up at certain times, while other ones fire up when and they don't fire up in that location. So, I don't think I'll ever work out fishing, Pete. I don't think I ever will. Likewise, I think. As a thinking angler, it's always good to have something to theorize about. It just has that extra aspect of fishing rather than it just being a set in stone sort of procedure, so to speak, where you, you have to do this to get here and then you got to do this and then put in the oven for 30 minutes and out comes your cake. No, there's uh, about 101 factors that have an influence and that's that's why there's this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's it. You know, listen to these podcasts. You can pick up so much info and you can dismiss what you think's, uh, you know, um, a bit of, a bit of BS and then take on what you, you believe. And I guess if you sit there and listen to these podcasts of different guests, you can pick up on certain things and go, Hey, he said that too, or, or whatever. And, you know, oh, I don't, I'm not a, big person to seek a lot of knowledge. My brain capacity can only handle so much. Um, me, I'm just out fishing and hammering areas as much as I can and changing plastics over and changing the weight. And yeah, it's, it's, I guess I'm addicted to fishing. You know, I'm curious cause I don't know if I knew everything, maybe I wouldn't be so addicted to it. Yeah. As an addict, how yeah. would one start to catch some of these fish in these lakes? What's the What's the method that you use? Well, um, the first thing I'll look at, this is what my 
this is my brain thought process. So I look at the tides. So that's the first thing. Number one. Otherwise, I don't bother. I look at the tides. I can see they're getting bigger and bigger. We're getting closer to a full or a new moon. Yeah. So that stagnant water, something interesting is about to happen. Something, something's about to change. They've been stagnant for a couple of weeks, two, three weeks. Something's about to change. So if you notice that, you know, you look at your tide charts and whatnot, it's bigger tides, um, use the new moon and the full moon as a guide. You can Google it and find out when it's happening in, in your area or your part of Australia. That's a good time to sort of really think about, okay, I think I'm going to go hit the landlocked lakes. But don't wait for a new moon or a new moon. Hit it beforehand. So I'm, talk, I'm talking three, four, five days beforehand yeah. because you've already got the tides. The tides just don't go, oh, new moon, Suddenly. they're going to go berserk. It goes like this, okay? So you get this thing happening and then it slowly gradually. So you want to sort of, as you start getting up here, you know, four or five days, start hitting it. And I say to people, hit it as many days in a row as you can around that time. I call it a window. So, you know, if someone said to me, if you can only fish once a month for five days, would you spread spread it out to once a week plus another day? Like just spread it out. I say, no, I would do five days in a row or I'd do three on the new and two on the full, for example, I'll, I'll hit those two times. So that's the first thought that goes through my head. When am I going to get the best chance? Um, secondly, know where you get your bait. Bait's a big one. I mean, I use liveys on these. Um, we get big bull mullet. I know yeah. that the laws are a bit different um, in New South Wales for using cast nets. Um, we use cast nets here. Get a couple of big bull mullet. Um, whack them on a hook. I've got a hook here to show you. Okay, so this, Pete, is a typical hook that I use. Um, I think they call them inline. Um, yep. The choice, mustard or BKK. So they're probably the two that I'd recommend to chase GTs. Size, I'd go a 9 -0, um, but I'm talking, you know, some of your bigger fish. Yeah, 9, -0 9 -0 is a serious, serious hook. Oh, yeah. I don't think I don't think these hooks are overly massive though um, for a nine o. I think they're a lot uh, small. This could be an eight o though. I don't have the pack in front of me, but that's the hook size I'd use um, straight through a bull mullet's mouth, or you can stick it um, behind the dorsal or in front of the dorsal, or even up near the tail if you want it to swim out. Yeah. Um, so. The line, the leader I use, you can see there I've cut it off, um, either a 100 or 120 pound leader. Okay, sounds heavy, but no, that's that's what you generally need. Always get a lighter just to make sure because some of these battles can be really furious and I just burn the end there and I mushroom the end of the hook. I don't know. Just so you... that it's going to, if it slips, it just grabs on. Yeah, it grabs on and it, uh, I don't know if you can see that. You know, there yeah. you go. It's sort of mushroomed on the end. It's just like in a, in a hard battle, um, you're eliminating or, or reducing your chances of something going really bad. Yeah. So that's the sort of the terminal tackle. Um, as far as the leader goes, I'd have around about a meter or so. Think about how big and long these fish potentially are. So if you've got like a, a 90 centimeter, a meter fish, when they're taking off at 100 mile an hour, um, the hook's in its mouth, the further and further it swims away, the lower the angle of your line starts to drop from the tip of your rod. And it gets yep. to a point where the line will actually start getting clipped by the tail. So if this fish is 80, 100 metres away, um, even with a sort of high rod, remember it's going to bend anyway because you've got a big fish on there, eventually your leader is going to start clipping the tail and we know giant trevally have got big scoots on them, big tail scoots. So they're um, like little bony things along the back of the tail there. Um, they can actually start clipping and damaging the line. And we have had some losses unexpected on heavy leader that we couldn't figure out why. Um, but they were fish that were right out, maybe yep. got tail wrapped. Um, all kinds of things can happen when you've got a big fish on. Um, That's what I was about to say. Mm. You're always going to run into trouble on a big fish. It's going to put the test to 
Oh, yeah. Your gear, your knots, everything. Literally 100%. your lock. Yeah. And, and if you want to know what rods I use, I brought one here. I've still got the leader on. Um, oh, that's some heavy leader, isn't it? What was I going for with that? Um, so this is a popping rod. Believe it or not, I use my popping rod. Okay. Yep. There's an FG knot. I don't know well you can see that. There's an FG knot right there. I've mushroomed the top of it as well. Okay. So I've done a risotto finish. Yeah. I didn't pronounce that right, did I? Risotto finish. Risotto, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like a, an Italian pasta. You and did. then, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've mushroomed the end really carefully. You don't want to burn your braid. This is 80 pound braid. Okay. And that there, yeah, that'd be 120, I reckon. So this is on a popping rod. Um, I recommend a, a P sort of 6 to 8 or 6 to 10. Um, you get some people, if you get this bloke coming up and goes, mate, I, uh, I hooked and, and landed one of these fish, uh, you know, on a, on a 4 to 7 kilo rod using 30 pound braid. And, and, and you'll, get, you'll get guys like that. Um, yep. Maybe if the fish is taking off and it head butts the wall and knocks itself out, or maybe if you just you, you can you're extremely lucky. If you if you seriously want to land one of these fish reliably, um, I'd probably dismiss that at first. Uh, make yeah. sure you sort of got the right gear for it. Uh, let's have a look here. I'm going to turn this thing around. Hang on a second. So so that's the reel I use. That might be familiar to a lot of people. That's a, uh, a pen slammer. So right. a pen slammer three. Um, what size is it? I think it's a 9,000, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. I think it's a 9,000. But that's sort of uh, a sort of budgety reel in the mid-range. I mean, you can go your, your full-on dog fights if you've got a spare 1,200 or 1,300 sitting in the bank, but you don't have to. I've stopped them on this, no worries. Um, yep. Well, I can't say no worries because they do give me a hard time, but, yeah, it's... um. Yeah, it's this. This will do the job anyway. Um, yeah, you don't have to spend a, an absolute fortune on gear, but just make sure you've got the right gear because it makes it a little bit easier for you. How many turns do you use for your FG knot? Okay, now that one there, I did. I did a video on YouTube years and years ago. Now that's, I think it's about one point six million views I got on that. Um, wow. Yeah, it's a big one. It's still the number one, even though it's sort of died out now. Um, I back then, I think I did about twenty in total. Since yep. then, we've we've sort of developed the FG knot, and we've and the good news is we've made it less complicated. So I tend to recommend now um, twelve to fourteen. And the reason for that is when you have a look at the FG knot. Uh, let's have a look here. There goes the drag. I don't know if you could hear that. So the FG knot. There we go. So basically, the longer you do it, there seems to be pressure on one end of the knot when it tightens. When it's under pressure, it seems to tighten on one end and not the other. Yes. So if you do less wraps, you're going to get more of an even pressure along your fluorocarbon leader. So 12 to 14 is about right. Um, the old 20, yeah, back in the day, everyone said 20, 25, 18. Um, but yeah, 12 to 14 is, is safe. Um, now when you're tightening your, your FG knot, it's always important after you've done it is to, is to do this and make sure it's nice and tight. Obviously, if you're tying, um, you know, six, six pound braid to, to 10 pound leader, be a little bit gentle because you, you will you will put a, a lot of grip on the on the leader yep. and you may damage it if you go hard but um and always wet I always say you know don't be afraid to 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 wet it there and then and then pull on it so you know heat heat's the worst enemy for for braid um more than fluorocarbon so yeah 12 to 14 is about right if you can try doing the the risotto finish um have a crack at that as well. Um, there's plenty of videos out there on it. Um, don't stress about it. I've, I'm left-handed. Um, yep. I'm, I, I was, I was born in a right-handed world 
And one of the, the things I always struggled with, it didn't matter what I did, you know, being a working in a lounge factory making lounges, um, it didn't matter what I did working at Fisher and Pike or back in the day when that factory was in, in the Redlands in Cleveland. Um, they taught me stuff and it took me honestly four to five times longer to learn how to do it and that's exactly what happened with the FG. Um, yep. I was shown by a mate and he did it flawlessly and he did it quick. Um, I sat there at home trying it thinking, you know, the, the, the left-handed curse has got me. I'm really struggling with this. Um, you know, I didn't feel confident and it, it took me a while until I sat down and I thought, yeah, I've really got it. Like I feel like I've got it now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's reliable. That's probably a big one. So, you know, for you guys at home, if you're, if you're struggling with these knots, don't beat yourself up about it. Um, I still struggle with new things. It doesn't matter what you show me. You show me a new knot. Um, sometimes I just don't get it. I don't understand it. Uh, I might have been fishing for 40 years and YouTuber and all that kind of stuff, but you know what? Forget all that stuff. Um, practice makes perfect. Don't beat yourself up if you can't get it. Just have a go. Sit there by yourself and have a go. Get a mate to sit down with you. And, and show you how to put these knots together. But hopefully that gives you a bit of a rundown of what I use for GTs. It's pretty simple. Leader, braid, a half decent rod, half decent reel, um, a de you know, decent knot and a good hook, good solid hook. And yeah. that's all you need. You don't need to go complicated. About the 12 to 14 reps, did you find that out by experimentation? Um, I actually, ex firstly, I experimented myself and I found it um, on some YouTube channels and I, I watched a lot of updated videos on the FG knot because there's always new ones coming through. Um, yep. Then it got to a point where I thought, well, I'm going to try that out and it's literally practical trial and error. Um, you know, when I was pulling these knots tight, I was seeing that the pressure of the braid gripping onto the, the leader it was sort of more evenly distributed as, a, as opposed to um, sort of cramping up tight in one end and being loose on the other. And I've tried them out on big fish and they haven't let me down. So I think as far as going 18 to 20, to be honest, it's not needed. Uh, have faith. It does work and I've, I've uh, had battles with some pretty big fish and they've, they've never slipped. It's always important. If you need that extra security on your bigger fish, don't be afraid. To go like this, I don't know if you can see it too well. Um, put a mushroom on the end. Yeah, put a mushroom. Yeah, hang on. That sounds like you, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, whack one of the mushrooms on the end. Um, you can always get a little rag and wet it, uh, you know, under the tap and, and just put it around there and get your lighter like this and then just go like that um, without burning your braid. If you, if you yeah. damage your braid or anything like that, cut it off tight again. Um, you'll, you'll learn how to get it right eventually. Yeah, I'll give a tip here. So yeah. I basically use my fingernails as a shield and my finger to block the flame. So I'll burn it right up until the fingertip. And yeah, I might burn myself sometimes, but it'll never burn the braid. You Sydney people are absolutely crazy. You're crazy mad. And <laughs> about the... I mean... I don't know if I'm correct about this, but it's interesting that everyone that uses the FG knot for a lot of their fishing, they notice how it tightens up, especially after a fight. You notice how the knot sort of loosens on one end because it's constricted on the other end. It's too many loops. That's why. It's it's too many loops. If you, sh if you do less loops, you'll find that there's more of an even displacement of pressure along the end of your fluorocarbon leader. Give it a shot. Um, and, and message me at Coast Fish TV on even on Facebook if it lets you down. I want to know about it because I don't think I'll get too many messages. I hope not. Oh, no. I, um, <laughs> I, I have reduced the amount of loops on my FG knot, oh, but good. I've, I've discovered that through testing. It's yeah. Like basically understanding how the yeah. knot tightens on one end. So I think that's one of the, yeah. It's just one of the keys to the knot in how it's tied in how it will tighten on that one end, which is the, actually it's the unfavorable end because you want it to tighten from the other side so that yeah. the whole knot will be How many loops? Tension. How many loops are you doing now? 
So I'm doing around 20 to 25, but I'm using six what? pound and eight pound. So it's a really? different sort of leader. Pete. But you, you, for you, heavy, you, <laughs> heavy, heavier leaders, it's about length rather than loops for me. Mm. So a lot of the videos okay. will say do about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half. And that might only equate to 15 reps. You know, mm. like you're using 80 pound here. So obviously the world of 80 pound is going to be very different to a smooth, slippery mm. Japanese, you know, fully silicone covered mm. light braid. Well, so I'd, I'd, I'd do a few more there yeah. for the light well, stuff. I've done about um, 10 to 12, going up north, throwing poppers, hooking 20, 25 kilo GTs, poppers, casting like mad yeah. on the reef and no slippage. So yeah. there could be something there. Uh, I'm not saying reduce your your FG knot loops down. It's it's you you've done your own testing on it, and I don't want you to lose any jewfish because um, I know how hard you work for them there. Yeah, so, but eighty uh, pound, you see, so eighty pound, you yeah. can imagine that ten wraps, it's going to get you a centimeter and a half of yeah of knot already. Hey, but, so, hey, but I do it on I do it on twelve pound leader. I do it on oh, twenty. Okay. Well, yeah. I do, yeah, hundred yeah. percent, yeah. And, and like I said, I had an awesome juice session. No slippage at all. I caught 16, this might sound a bit mad, 16 Jew in about a week and a half, all lamb-based. Um, most of them were soapies. Um, there was about three half-decent ones in the 70s, late 60s. Um, never let down at all. I reckon, um, I reckon have a go. Try the, try the, the 12 to 14 max and see how you go. And let me know if you lose a fish. I want to know about it. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll, actually, I'll give that a go because there's nothing better than tying a knot faster. Exactly. With less work to be done. You see, yeah, you'll so thank me later. It would be, yeah, it'd <laughs> definitely be something that I'd look into. Do it, Pete. <laughs> now, we talked about, you know, how to catch these fish, you know, liveies and the sorts of rigs and even the gear, the rods, the reels, um, obviously... Don't go in with a 47 kg unless you just want a big run and get smoked. Uh, but, you know, you can do it if that's the only gear you've got, like somebody <laughs> did with 30 pound. What's, uh, what's something else that would be relevant here? Do you use lures at all or is it more of a bait prospect? We're talking, we're talking landlocked lake fish. Um, I've had this jet. Now, they have been caught on lures. There's no doubt about that. Because um, we can talk about GTs, uh, mm. but like you said, there's also, let me go through the list. There's obviously mangrove jacks, maybe not to 80 centimeters, but, you know, 60 plus, 70 plus. Um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? That uh, Giant herring. Giant herring, that's the tarpon. one. Tarpon. You've got a whole smorgasbord of like, toothy critters in there as well oh yeah that could yeah. fall prey to you know not just liveies but all sorts of other techniques so i was just wondering if someone wanted to throw a lure could they do that and what sort of approach could they take well gts what tends to work in the landlocked lakes um is the big swim baits so the ones with segments right. in them um you know two or three segments um quite large ones they so they're motivated okay. by price as well of lure. So obviously swim baits being pretty much the most expensive things you could throw. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, actually, hang on a second. I'm not plugging these because I'm not sponsored. This here, they can be, okay, so that was 79 bucks. They're, yeah, they're expensive. The Jackal. What, what are they? I, I didn't, oh, the Jackal Ganty. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So I bought one, um, I threw it out in a landlocked lake, I did a couple of casts, bow wave came behind it, I was using a bait caster at the time, uh, I had 60 pound leader, I paused, whack, it smashed it, big splash, gone. Gone, oh no. Gone. So it was, a, it was, I just bought it, pulled it out of the packet, rigged it up that morning. Yep. Um, I was, I've still got the video. I, uh, I sent it to the, uh, I sent it to Sporty's Fishing and I said, this is what happened. They work that well. <coughs> and this is not a plug. Uh, I'm not sponsored by anyone. 
um, they worked that well that uh, I said, uh, that's how well they worked. And he said, oh, my God, um, you're a bit heartbroken. I said, just a little bit. And uh, he looked after me. Um, another one is this one here. What does that look like to you? I can't see that one. That looks a bit like a, a jackal, what's it called, the metal vibe. Yeah, it's um, it's a good little lure. Uh, have you heard of Biwa? Biwa lures? Yes, B I W W A. Yeah, I like them because they they do such a good job of these lures. Like that's quite heavy. That's slow sinking. But these yep. tend to do quite well. It's a metal um, metal um, metal vibe. Wood. Yeah, it feels woody. Oh, sorry, not metal. Uh, but yeah, I get what. Yeah, I don't want to call them metal. Are they metal? You know, some of the other ones that are of the same. They're plastic, oh, I, aren't they? Hard plastic. Yeah, I don't. I don't exactly know, but it's definitely not metal. Yeah, not that one. Yeah, it's that wood. one. Yeah. That one there. Um, I'm. I'm just trying to think of what lure am I thinking of here? It's a jackal. It's pretty expensive. Twenty five, thirty bucks a pop. People love throwing them yeah. for yellow belly and bass. Lipless crankbait. Okay. Can't, I just can't get that name. That's not metal, is it? That's hard plastic, or but I call it metal. I don't know why I'm calling it metal. That there's that many lot. lures. There's that many lures. It's like I, I say, give them a go. Grab it. Grab a cheaper swim bait. I mean, you can get. I don't use all the expensive gear. There we by go. The way. I've just I've just thrown it into good old Google, and it said it's a yeah. TN60, TN70. You know those ones? No. Yeah. Well, they look pretty much like that B while there. Oh, do they? Yeah, just, just a lot um, smaller. How much is this guy? Um, Twenty two ninety five. That's not too bad. Yeah, a raffle, a raffle. It's called full wire reinforced. Yeah, you're okay. gonna need that. Yeah, hundred uh, seventy five gram, thirteen centimeter. So that's a sinking. Yep. So that's the bomb. I mean, you can basically. Um, it's endless. You can you can spend thousands and thousands on lures, and they never end. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's trying to work out what works in your area for what you're fishing for. Swim baits, GTs, Cuda, Barra. Um, these guys, Barra. But I haven't yep. caught one yet. But um, it's never ending. What about for mangrove jack? What sort of lures would you be throwing? You can get them on plastics, on paddle tails, um, four and five inch with a big tail on them. Some of the guys that uh, some of the guys that go for them in the in the rivers and whatnot, they drop them down, big jig he heads on them, and just do a fast wind and try and get a reaction bite on them. And they just cast and cast and cast and don't stop. In the lakes, they have been caught on paddle tails. They've been caught on all sorts of lures. The fish. In landlocked lakes, seem to be a funny species. Um, they seem to be a little bit more switched on, a bit smarter. Um, maybe there's less competition, so they're not as aggressive as the fish in the rivers. Even the, the smaller GTs in the rivers, when they're on, you can get them left, right, and all day. Same yeah. with the mangrove jacks. Landlocked lakes, um, they seem to be a little bit, a little bit more switched on. I know they're there. I've wound past them, and sometimes I'll just shy away. So landlocked lake fish are tricky. Um, you've got to work for them. You've got to work generally harder for them. Um, they seem to have a higher IQ, and their reaction bites um, don't come as, as readily as, as some of the river fish do. How would you say the next three months would play out in the landlocked lake? Uh, what would you be your approach if you wanted to catch something in them? Something decent, but maybe it doesn't specifically have to be a GT. You can get GTs around this time. Um, a couple of guys have got them recently in the past sort of couple of weeks. Um, mangrove jacks, much harder to get. It's like they've shut down. They're not happy. We know they eat, but they right. must be very selective. Um, giant herring, we can still get giant herring around now. Um, first light, last light. Surface lures, shallow divers, um, white bait, um, generally the three things that I use to catch giant herring. Tarpon, really small lures, small jig heads, like one-eighth jig heads. Yep. Um, 
nice small lure with a paddle tail on there, reasonably light line, throw them out, let them hit the bottom, and a slow wind, maybe a little jiggle jiggle of the rod, wind, let it drop, slow wind, and see if the tarp on around. But it's a tougher time of the year where we are. I don't know about yep. you guys in Sydney. Um, the species seem to, some come in and some sort of say goodbye. Um, but once we start hitting September, October, late September, that October, you start seeing some of the the, the traditional summer fish come on. And uh, I'm waiting for that time of the year. Yeah, no, it's quiet here in Sydney. Well, it's not quite just yet, but there are definite sure signs that things are starting to slow down. Uh, but I, I would expect, at least in Sydney, by around August time, even if you soak a pilchard, maybe even after three hours you bring it in, it wouldn't even have been pecked at by a really? bait fish, by a pecker. Yeah, no, it's that bad sometimes. Wow. So it is gets it... that time of year in Sydney where nothing is even active, but we haven't quite hit that point yet. But it is definitely slowing down. Really interesting. I've, I've always been fascinated about the Sydney Harbour. Um, it's a beautiful spot and it used to be really dirty, didn't it? Yeah, that's right. It probably still is. It just visually, it looks quite appealing these days. The water still looks a bit green and blue, so that's nice. But yeah, head up the river and it's, it could look brown, but it could have some sort of weird reddish tinge to it at times. And you know that that's not normal. Especially mm. in the Cooks River, we have that situation where the water color just looks like on any particular day, could pick a color of the rainbow, it could be that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just want to catch a kingfish in there. But when I go again, can I hit you up? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. All right, sweet. sweet. You'll catch a three-eyed kingfish in the Cooks River, but they are in there. <laughs> it's crazy. All right, so we went over in light detail, uh, you know, about the gear that you used you know, for live baiting. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, well, um, one of the other species that you might come across in landlocked lakes is the mangrove jack. My biggest is 66. I've been working for it for a long time. Yeah. I have hooked some monsters and I did lose one at my feet a couple of weeks before I landed my PB. And then I managed to get into the 60s club within the same month um, with with a 60 and then a 66 um nice i'll just i'll just show you like this is one of my favorite lines to use leaders this guy right here so the Oshia from shimano one of my favorite leaders to use it's sort of the the mid to high range but it's not the high high range so you can spend a lot more on leaders but this is a really good leader i'll use this in 10 12 pound 20 30 i've got 30 i've got uh, 40 I've got 60, yep. um, just one of my faves. So if you, you head to your tackle store and pick one of those up, I recommend it. Um, here's a hook that I love using. So these are the C points and I will tag black magic in a lot of my catches. Um, really, really sharp, strong hooks. One of my faves. Um, grab a pack of those as well. Um, rod and reel for the mangrove jack in landlock lakes. And you can use these for dewies as well. Um, that's a four and a half thousand, I think. Uh, oh, it's a five thousand. There you go. It just went up. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was about to say it looked to be bigger than a four. In your yeah, hand in it was. It was bigger by five hundred. So, <laughs> um, a veritas. Yeah, I use a veritas as well. So yep. that's a, a PE. Hang on, three to five. So that's for the mangrove jacks. That's pretty um, affordable. You know, yeah, yeah, you, like like even you know even the old BGs are they've got the BGMQ series in now. So a lot of my reels over the back there, um, they're the MQs now. So I've sort of upgraded. Um, yeah, they're just my faves. I, I I'm not loaded. I don't go spending thousands and thousands on 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 rods and reels. Well, if you look at that, it sort of makes a liar out of me. But that's over many many years of collecting them together. Um, yep. But you don't need to be super rich to, to get the gear that's going to do the job. And, you know, I've put a lot of this gear through its paces on all kinds of different fish. So I just have my personal favourites. Um, everyone has their favourites, but that's just the stuff I like to use. And um, whether it's the way, for example, it ties and, it, and after you do a tie on it, um, some of them have very high memory and they can bow up. This one just goes nice and straight. 
Um, I, I just love it, and it's got good abrasion resistance. Everyone has their faves, and, and they're, they're just a couple of mine. Before we finish up, Andy, is there any point you'd like to make, at least in regards to landlocked lake fishing, or maybe just fishing in general, just land-based in that sort of situation that you'd like to give our viewers a bit more insight into? Yeah, look, um, land-based fishing and especially landlocked fishing, it can be a challenge. We know that. Um, yes, I do put in a lot of hours, but that doesn't matter because I enjoy what I do. So if you're enjoying fishing and you need to put several hours in or you're going and spending, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 hours a week fishing, um, try and look at it as, as an enjoyable thing because that's what fishing is. Um, having the right gear, you don't need to spend a fortune, going at the right times, looking for those little windows. And I spoke to you, uh, spoke a little bit earlier about the some of the peak times to fish with the moons and tides and whatnot. Um, you know, having the, the right terminal tackle is a big one. For example, nice sticky hooks. Um, have a think about the terminal tackle that you're using and it, and it gives you a bit of confidence when you land based or landlocked fishing as well. You, if you've got the right tackle, it doesn't have to be top of the tier. Um, it just gives you a little bit of psychological confidence as well. And obviously, um, it helps uh, helps you get fish too. So enjoy what you're doing. And, and it's a journey. And landlocked fishing uh, and land-based fishing, I think, is for life until you can't throw a rod anymore. So just enjoy that big, long path, the, the yellow brick road. It'll go almost forever and uh, enjoy the experiences. Awesome, Andy. Look, I'm going to bring the podcast home now. Is there anyone that you'd like to thank like a, that's contributed along to your success? You know, it could be just your fishing life or YouTube or, you know, any other aspect of it. And, of course, let everyone know how they can find you on social media as well. Yeah. I'm sure it's yeah. not too hard. There's probably a, about a 101 places they can find you, but make sure you mention it here. Yeah, I will. Um, I guess my just want to thank my dad for throwing me into fishing from such a long age and, and me being the introvert that I am, um, despite doing something that's seen as very social, um, finding a love from an early age and I guess never losing that love of fishing. Um, you know, the mates that I fish with uh, over the years, whether it's Pete back in the in the 1980s or or Benno or, and, and Chris in the more recent times. Um, yeah, it's just there's there's so many things that in life that uh, I could have been doing, but I was just stuck on this. And one of the things is just thanking um, the people that follow me. Um, give a thumbs up and they comment. You know, it's not just about, hey, all for the likes, which people can throw out there nice and loosely. It's actual genuine support for me. Um, it shows me that that someone genuinely enjoyed what they what they saw, and you know, doing an episode, a lot of effort goes into it. I put a lot of work into it. The editing's probably the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, I enjoy the journey, and and when someone engages or or shoots me a message, um, I'm just like, wow, you know, people are actually listening and watching and 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 getting something from from what I'm doing. So yeah, I, I, I'm just I'm very grateful, very grateful. How can people find you? What's your YouTube handle, your Instagram, and so yeah, forth? Yeah, well, it's it's Coast Fish TV. It's no spaces though. That's the big one. If you type, if you put spaces in between Coast and Fish and TV, it could come up anywhere. But if you just type it in as one word, no spaces, um, you'll find it on Google, um, YouTube, YouTube yeah. channel. I think I've got about eighty-eight or something episodes. Sit down and just watch them. You can actually see some, from way back some of my terrible camera work um, <laughs> and hosting. Oh, my God. I was, I, was sh I was shocking at hosting. So don't worry. You might go, Andy, you, you're a natural. Mate, I'm not a natural. It's <laughs> yeah, how many outtakes are there? And I can't think of what I'm saying. It's, it's normal. Um, so you can find me there on the tube. Enjoy that journey. Play them. And after each video, if you like it, give it a like, throw us a comment because I will be looking um, after the podcast goes out, after this one goes goes live, Pete, for people that have commented and 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 
and, and check out those comments. So another one's Instagram as well, the IG. Um, check that out. Same thing, Coast Fish TV. Um, you can see some of the fish I've caught there and, and whatnot. And uh, also Facebook. Facebook's probably probably the biggest. Um, I'm trying to get to the 50,000. Um, I don't know whether I'll slow down after that, but uh, yeah, that's been a, a good little journey too. So Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they're the main ones. And, uh, you know, like I said, engage with me. I'm, I'm, I'm not a stuck up guy. I'm very, very approachable. I'll talk to anyone. I'll help anyone. I don't care whether you've been fishing um, for, for two years, two months, two weeks, or 20 years, or where, what status you are. I don't care. I'll, I'll talk to anyone. Um, so, yeah, I would love to hear from you. Excellent. I'll put your details in the description as well so everyone can just find that. And yeah, ladies and gents, uh, that's Andy Sparnon from Coast Fish TV talking about landlocked giants in the Gold Coast region. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to this one. This is a Shroom signing out.